Hello, I'm Wesley Powers. I collect BB guns, uh, boys BB guns, and we're talking today on the early history of BB guns, or air rifles as they were called back then. They stressed the term air rifle. Uh, all the companies did because it was more like dad's rifle, I, I believe. All their advertisements, they were called air rifles, not BB guns. But uh, the history kind of starts with a BB gun made for boys and aimed at the boy market by Markham. And he was located in Plymouth, Michigan. He made uh, a lot of wood products, wood cisterns, wood tubs, uh, a lot of wood products. And his first attempt at a, a BB gun was an all wood model. Uh, I have advertisements showing this gun in 1887. Uh, it's reported that his first efforts were in 1886, a gun very, very similar to this. This gun had a patch box in the stock for the BBs, which would come off real, real easy. And this gun is called Markham's Air Rifle. Uh, then later on, Markham got a uh, order with a big firm in Chicago and they had uh, one of the agreements was to change the name of the gun to the Chicago. So all the later guns are marked down on the stock, Chicago, Markham's Chicago. And, uh, but this was the one that really started the whole air rifle industry just because it was so cheap, boys could afford it. Other early air guns and air rifles at the time were so expensive that no kid could buy it. Uh, and they were predominantly indoor gallery, air, uh, indoor gallery type rifles, very expensive. But this, this started it all. And we also have a gun. I have an advertisement for this gun in, in 1888. This is, was made over in Ilion, New York. Uh, this is called an Atlas. And uh, this is actually before the Daisy Company, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and this ad, this rifle in the uh, ad was called the Volunteer. That's a very petite little gun. Uh, this is all brass construction here, cast iron lever. This gun cocked like this, and you're pulling back a piston, and uh, it's not quite cocked. You're pulling back a piston, and it's a spring-loaded piston, it shoots it out. Uh, there again, Ilian, New York. Okay, uh, in 18. 87 Clarence Hamilton uh, designed an air rifle and he went into business with a guy named Cyrus Pinckney to produce that air rifle and it was called the Plymouth Air Rifle Company. This gun was made off the patent drawing. Uh, this isn't an actual antique piece, it's scaled right off the patent drawing but it's, it's a lever action gun. The lever would cock down and you're pulling a piston back. But in the patent drawing, it shows it as being all wood. And uh, the actual production gun that was sold to the public, this is what it ended up looking like. You can see the similarities. Had the same, you know, the cocking lever and everything. And this is the production model. And this is the gun that uh, was sold. And uh, uh, the company started out 1888 and they made several different model guns. This was the most popular of the Plymouth Air Rifle guns. Uh, more of these were made than any other model. And uh, that was about 1888. Well then, Clarence did not, Clarence Hamilton did not stay with the Plymouth Air Rifle Company very long. He left them and he invented another gun with a wire stock 
and uh, he presented it to the Plymouth Iron Windmill Company, which he was a director of and had stock in, and proposed to them that they make this air rifle. Well, at the time, the Plymouth Air Rifle Company was across the railroad tracks, uh, right beside the railroad tracks. They were making, uh, you know, their Plymouth Air Rifle gun, and the Markham was right across the railroad tracks, making his air rifle. And uh, so the company decided to take up Hamilton on his proposal and start making a gun. And this was the first, which ended up being called a Daisy. And later on, the company changed the name to Daisy. And uh, this was a top lever gun, broke like this. And single shot, the BB was dropped down in. And yes, it was made very, very cheap, but like all these boys' guns, they were made cheap so the boys could uh, afford to buy them or work for them. And, and uh, a lot of the guns were set up where you could sell seeds or magazine subscriptions, uh, and the kids could work you know, for their gun and, and, and earn it that way. Uh, there's a lot of stories written about the first model Daisy about how it was given away as a windmill premium. Uh, I don't believe that at all. Uh, it's a little pet peeve of mine. I did a lot of research in that era and I've never been able to find anything out of the 1880s stating that that, that practice was actually uh, done. Uh, when the Iron Windmill Company started making this gun, their windmill business was uh, real poor and the company was going bad, badly broke. And uh, they were talking about going out of business. And uh, at the same time, these two other companies, Markham and Plymouth Air Rifle Company, were in the newspapers every other week, how they could not keep up with production, how they were having a hard time getting enough workers even and materials to keep up with their demand. Uh, there would have been absolutely no reason for Plymouth Iron Windmill Company to try to give away a BB gun to sell a uh, windmill. Uh, so until some proof comes up about that, you know, that'll be unproven to me. Uh, Then uh, we, we'll kind of step back here to the Plymouth Air Rifle Company. Later on, uh, the Plymouth Air Rifle Company made an all wooden gun. And this, as you see, looks so much like the, the Chicago model, all wooden construction, very, very cheaply made. And uh, Plymouth Air Rifle Company actually calls this the challenge. It's marked here in the cast plate challenge. And uh, this was the Plymouth Air Rifles Company. Uh, they're challenged to the Chicago product, you know, the Chicago Air Rifle product. But, uh, and you can see how it's just modeled so much, so much like the, the, um, Chicago. And uh, then about 1889, we had two guys. This was designed by Stanley, and this was designed by a guy named Joslin. Uh, both of them right about that 1889 period. And Stanley actually lived in Plymouth. And uh, he designed this gun, he invented this gun. But then he found some uh, financial backers in Northville, Michigan, which is only you know, maybe three miles away from Plymouth. It's just north and it's just next door. And one of the uh, promoters was this guy, Joslin. 
So there was four guys went into business to produce, they call it the Stanley Air Rifle. And uh, this gun, you can see how this looks so much like the Chicago we were talking about earlier, all wooden construction. This particular gun cocks like this, you're pulling back a piston. Uh, this gun here, this breaks open and you're pulling back a spring-loaded piston. Um, but this company that the four guys went together to form uh, ended up being called the Globe Air Rifle Company and most all of their product was labeled Globe and uh, uh, but this is the early years, this is the very beginnings of the Globe Air Rifle Company for these two, two models here, both made in, in Northville, Michigan. Okay, we're talking about the Atlas Air Rifle Company, Illion, New York, hometown of uh, Remington. And uh, this particular gun was called the Volunteer in a 1888 magazine advertisement. The, uh, this atlas cocked by pulling the lever down and this rod is actually part of the piston, spring-loaded piston, the rod would come back catching the sear and then when you touched it off the piston went forward. Very, very petite little rifle. Uh, this actually is a repeater. It shoots more than one uh, BB. All the rest of the single shot at the time you dropped the BB down the barrel after each shot this one you could actually, the barrel turned and then you would load it and there's like a trough up here that so you had this many BBs and you loaded it and then turned it and covered up that port again and and each time you cocked the gun you'd have to hold it up the BB would drop down into the air tube and shoot her out. Uh, so this was a little uh, ahead of its time in that all the other companies were making single shots and this particular gun was a repeater. The Atlas company uh, was in business for several years and this is one of their later product. Uh, this was called a, a dandy and uh, they went to a cast iron receiver area. The barrel, this happens to be a, a single uh, a repeater. The gun was made in a single shot version and a repeater version. They look alike except you know one single shot and one's a repeater. Same principle of trigger guard lever cocking down and you're pulling back spring-loaded piston and uh, Then they went to a gun that had uh, Atlas in the grip, which actually was a much nicer looking gun. This happens to be a single shot. You know, there's no provision for the barrel to turn or to put any more BBs in or anything. Just strictly a single shot Atlas. Okay, just a little earlier we showed you a first model Daisy. I'm going to talk about a few other early Daisy models. This is a second model Daisy. Also, was, this gun was a break open. If you remember that first model Daisy, the lever came up to cock. This breaks open, you're pulling back the spring-loaded piston. This one had cast iron receiver area. This is all cast iron wire stock. and. Uh, the second model Daisy was a very short-lived gun. Uh, Daisy did not make it very long, so this is a very, very difficult gun to find. Uh, the whole gun was nickel-plated. The air chamber here is a zinc, uh, and it had a very bad habit of degrading over time and over years, and it broke very easy. So it's a you know, they did not survive very well. Uh, this is the second model, 1890.
just about 1890. There's a patent on this gun, uh, May the 6th, 1890. And it was actually called on the gun, Daisy's Improved. And then this is one of the, we call it a third model Daisy. You see how it went from that second model and the pretty straight grip. They went to a, a pistol grip. Quite a few variations in these third models daisies, but uh, this particular one had a wire stock and it had uh, a wood insert. The gun can be found with or without this wood. It uh, just depends on when the gun was made, Dif just different variations. And uh, But this was a, a progression from the first model at cocked here, the second model broke open, this third model also was a break open, uh, cast iron, cast iron. And then just before the turn of the century, they came up with a model and they called it the Daisy 20th Century. Also this was a break open gun. You can find this one with several variations. This one has a hanging tag that came with a gun. That's what's flopping around here. Uh, and uh, by now the, the uh, shot tube would come out. A lot of these early guns had problems with the BBs getting stuck in the barrel because uh, they were lead air rifle shot at the time and they were different sizes and uh, so that was a problem. So the uh, tube coming out, you were able to get out that bad shot real easy. So that was an improvement. Okay, they had, had a little feature to get those BBs, the bad BBs out and I'll show you here. You just pushed a little spring and the shot tube would come out and then you could push a wire or rod or anything through here to get out that odd size BB, you know, the and uh, made it a whole lot easier for the kid to do two things. It made it easier to get out that bad BB and then it made it easier to lose the shot tube and make it all of a sudden just a toy gun instead of a uh, BB gun. And then as they progress, this is still a uh, Daisy 20th century, but now it's all sheet metal. They were getting rid of cast iron parts. More and more and more cast iron uh, parts were being changed to sheet metal, which the sheet metal is uh, so much easier uh, to work with, uh, cheaper, better construction. Uh, you know, this is all sheet metal. This sheet metal here, still a cast iron trigger guard, and still a cast iron trigger, which stuck around the stuck around for a long time, but they finally ended up going sheet metal on triggers and uh, trigger guards. But uh, 20th century, and this came also in a single shot and a repeater version, and a lot of variations in this gun. Uh, we won't get into them. Then Daisy came up with a, a lever action gun. This was not the first lever action gun in, in uh, the industry, but this happens to be Daisy's first. Uh, I think when these were brand new, this 20th, uh, this uh, thousand shot lever action gun had to have been the, the nicest looking gun that Daisy produced. Uh, it's one of my favorites, and uh, this came in a 500 shot version, which was a shorter barrel, and a 1,000 shot version. There was a lot of variations in these guns, uh, and this came out about uh, 1904, and uh, uh, this also is called the Bennett model by collectors. Daisy never ever advertised it as the Bennett model, but the story goes 
uh, Bennett, Charlie Bennett was a uh, one of the uh, he was a salesman at the time and he was on a trip to China and, and uh, they thought the gun was a real firearm and he said, oh, no, no, this won't hurt you and he, he gave it to one of the Chinese mandarins and he flipped up his, uh, the tails of his coat and asked to be shot in the rear end and so he ended up making the sale and uh, forever this has been called the Bennett model because this was the model supposedly he used in that that escapade. Uh, you ask any collector about a Bennett model and this is the one they're talking about but there again it's never ever called the Bennett model by Daisy. Uh, and while we're talking about lever action guns, we'll kind of go backwards. This was a company in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and the company, uh, this was designed by a guy named Bailey. And uh, two guys, Bailey and Smith, went together, formed a company, and, and uh, this was 1893 patent. This particular gun was made about 1894 and it was advertised as a Bailey. Uh, this gun was actually the first of the lever action, you know, your traditional lever action thousand shot BB gun, uh, which well, like 15 years after this, it kind of became the industry standard. Thousand shot lever action guns were pretty much standard and of course even then a lot of 500 shot guns but uh, but uh, this was the first company to to make that gun. This particular gun is heavy. I mean it's heavy. This is all cast iron and most of the guns the company made, the whole receiver was all cast iron, very ornate. They had animals in there and flowers and dogs and birds in the different models. The company made quite a few different models. Um, later in the company's history, they made some sheet metal guns towards the end. They're again getting away from cast iron parts and uh, which pretty much all the companies that were in business long enough changed from cast iron into sheet metal uh, just because of the cost and uh, ease of manufacturing. But this is, uh, there again, this is one of the Colombians we call it out of uh, Philadelphia. Okay, this company here was the Henry C. Hart Company in Detroit, Michigan. This gun was a repeater. This company made all kinds of products. Uh, it was a big company. Their main product was railroad equipment. And uh, he has a patent on this gun, the matchless. This matchless, the, the lever pulls up. You're pulling back spring-loaded piston. And uh, this is about 1890. And, uh, the company made two variations of guns. This one with matchless on the side, nicely shaped. The second model, it was flat here and it just had matchless up here. This is cast iron, uh, brass air chamber, brass barrel. Now the company did not make their gun very long and then they sold out to a company in uh, Chicago, Illinois, the Adams Westlake Company. They made the matchless just like this, the second model matchless that I had mentioned, but it looked like this. And then they also made two other models. This model here is marked champion, stamped in the stock on one side and carbine on the other. This was a real oddball looking gun. This is all cast iron. 
lever underneath to cock it. You're pulling back spring-loaded piston, but it's a real oddball looking piece. The barrel is interesting because you always hear about those hex barreled guns. This is actually a six-sided six -sided barrel uh, instead of an octagonal or a round barrel. This gun uh, is a very scarce gun, very, very few of these around, but Champion Carbine. The company also made another oddball looking piece. This is marked Columbia on a side. And this gun was, uh, you push the barrel back and the whole entire assembly is pushing back. It's spring-loaded piston. You push it back far enough and it'll catch in a sear. You bring the barrel back and then you would touch it off. There again, a very oddball looking piece. Uh, only two of these known. This gun here and there's one in a museum in Nebraska. Uh, but it's called uh, Columbia and it's stamped in the stock over here. Very unusual little period piece. Mid 1890s. We talked about the Plymouth Air Rifle Company uh, and I showed you their patent style gun and their first model. The company was in business 88 to 1894 when the company burned down. And one of their last models was a Bijou. Well, right after the company burned down, another company formed up in New York, and I'm sorry, a company formed in Detroit and came out with a Bijou model. This model is so much like the Plymouth Air Rifle Company Bijou. Uh, internally and, and it's also it's a break open. Uh, some of the parts are almost interchangeable, it's so close. Uh, but uh, this company started making a gun, all cast iron, cast iron, and then they evolved to a uh, all sheet metal gun. Like we mentioned earlier, the companies were doing away with cast iron, going to sheet metal. But all of their, uh, their models were called Bijous, and they also had a model called uh, Hexagon. Another oddball with a six-sided barrel, the Hexagon. And uh, we showed you Markham's Chicago a little earlier. This was also another early gun, 1890. This was their first break open gun and this is called a King, King model. There again 1890 cast iron receiver, this is all cast iron and uh, this particular gun was made in several variations over the years up into the teens and like the competition they started out all cast iron, changed to sheet metal later as they progressed like all the companies did away with cast iron uh, but this is the King model and this was one of their the company's main models they made real early. Another company also in Michigan this was up in uh, Grand Rapids Michigan was the Cycloid company. This company uh, their biggest product was bicycles. They made a lot of bicycles uh, and uh, it was a cycloid cycle. You can find some of these guns marked, this one's marked Cycloid Cycle Company, Grand Rapids. Uh, some of them you can find marked uh, Rapid Rifle Company and even in their ads, some of the ads are Rapid Rifle, some are Cycloid. Cyc cycloid. Uh, interesting thing about this gun is the stock is two pieces of metal and it's riveted together here. Uh, I do have one in my collection with a wood stock but other than that all of them are a sheet metal stock and uh, uh, there again this company started out cast iron and the very last models the company made 
it's a, it's a sheet metal, all sheet metal gun. Ugly looking gun, you know, with that lever, long, great big long lever. And uh, this all sheet metal really looks, <laughs> looks homely. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and this particular gun is marked uh, Rapid Rifle Company. out of Grand Rapids. Another company in Michigan uh, was the Crescent Company. This company is up in uh, Saginaw, Michigan. The company was a rather large company. They made all kinds of products uh, and uh, the air gun business was just a very, very small portion of their business. Uh, the company made single shot rifles and repeaters. Uh, the typical break open design. And uh, the guy that invented this gun, by the way, a little interesting tidbit, he left the Crescent Company, left Saginaw and came down and went to work for Daisy and uh, he was one of the engineers at Daisy and you can find a patent that shows a gun that looks just like this only assigned to Daisy Manufacturing Company. Uh, basically it was an improvement he patented an improvement on this gun while he worked for Daisy so it, it, the patent looks like he's patenting this crescent.